Today I decided it's important to read to you Encounter with the Self by Edward Edinger. Dr. Edinger calls this book his portable analytic hour, so his portable psychotherapy for anyone to carry around, and therefore it seems quite important. The subtitle of this book is A Jungian Commentary on William Blake's Illustrations of the Book of Job. William Blake was a poet and writer in the late 18th and early 19th century. These engravings, which I'm going to show you today in connection with this reading, were produced by Mr. Blake in 1825. And you have to keep in mind that because these are engravings, all of these images, including all the words on the images, had to be etched onto a printing plate backward. It's quite an amazing accomplishment, as you will see. Encounter with Self is published by Inner City Books. As you can see, my copy is quite dog-eared. To Diane, note, the term self is used by Jung to designate the transpersonal center and totality of the psyche. It constitutes the greater objective personality whereas the ego is the lesser subjective personality. Empirically, the self cannot be distinguished from the God image. Encounter with it is a tremendous mystery. Preface, quote, The experience of the self is always a defeat for the ego. C.G. Jung, Mysterium Conjunctionis mystery of the conjunction. There is in the unconscious a transpersonal center of latent consciousness and obscure intentionality. The discovery of this center, which Jung called the self, is like the discovery of extraterrestrial intelligence. Man is now no longer alone in the psyche and in the cosmos. The vicissitudes of life take on new and enlarged meaning. Dreams, fantasies, illness, accident, and coincidences become potential messages from the unseen partner with whom we share our life. At first, the encounter with the self is indeed a defeat for the ego, but with perseverance, Deo Valente, with the will of God, Inshallah, light is born from the darkness. One meets the Immortal One, who wounds and heals, who casts down and raises up, who makes small and makes large, in a word, the One who makes one whole. Introduction C. G. Young's answer to Job has established the story of Job as crucial to the psyche of modern man. With our attention focused on this theme, we can now see more clearly the relevance of its other expressions in modern times. As for instance, Goethe's Faust, Melville's Moby Dick, and Blake's illustrations of the Book of Job. Jung tells us that, quote, the Book of Job serves as a paradigm for a certain experience of God which has a special significance for us today, unquote. In other words, the Job story is an archetypal image which pictures a certain typical encounter between the ego and the self. This typical encounter may be called the Job archetype. The chief features of the Job archetype are 1. An encounter between the ego and the greater personality parentheses, God, angel, superior being Close parentheses. Two, a wound or suffering of the ego as a result of the encounter. Three, the perseverance of the ego, which endures the ordeal and persists in scrutinizing the experience in search of its meaning. And four, a divine revelation by which the ego is rewarded with some insight into the transpersonal psyche. Now, separately, I have 
essentialized this Job archetype as contest. You try to accomplish something in your life and you are prevented from doing it. Defeat, you fail. Lamentation, you meditate on the reasons for your failure and rebirth you go on to the next thing in your life. So the essentialized version is contest, defeat, lamentation, rebirth. Each time you go through that cycle, your ego will become stronger. And you need to go through that cycle many times in order to realize your potential. You can find another video on this YouTube channel entitled how to live an authentic life. Please look for it. Going on, in addition to the book of Job, there are many other examples of this archetype. For instance, I should mention the following. Jacob and the angel of Yahweh, Arjuna and Krishna, Paul and Christ, Moses and al Kidr from the Quran, Faust and Mephistopheles, Captain Ahab and Moby Dick, Nietzsche and Zarathustra, Jung and Philemon. The Book of Job represents an individual ego's decisive encounter with the self, the greater personality. The ego is wounded by this encounter, which provokes a descent into the unconscious, a nakia. Because Job perseveres in questioning the meaning of the experience, his endurance is rewarded by a divine revelation. The ego, by holding fast to its integrity, is granted a realization of the self. There's a footnote on this page. Jung answered to Job in Psychology and Religion, West and East, Collected Works, Volume 11, Paragraph 562. Answer to Job is also available separately from Princeton University Press, 50th edition, 2010. As a framework for the discussion, I have chosen to comment on William Blake's illustrations of the Book of Job, published in 1825. This series of 22 engravings is Blake's masterwork, done when he was beyond the age of 65. It was his last major completed work. These engravings are inspired and are worthy to be set beside the story which they illustrate. Blake's rendering of the Job story shows us the effect of this archetypal image on the unconscious of a modern or almost modern man. Scholars can inform us what Blake consciously intended to convey in these pictures. However, as with most great works of art, Blake expressed far more than he knew. In these pictures, the objective psyche speaks directly to us. Jung distinguishes between two types of artistic creation, the psychological and the visionary. About the latter, he writes, quote, it is a primordial experience which surpasses man's understanding and to which in his weakness he may easily succumb. The very enormity of the experience gives it its value and its shattering impact. Sublime, pregnant with meaning, yet chilling the blood with its strangeness, it arises from timeless depths. In contrast, the psychological mode of artistic creation deals with experiences of the foreground of life. These never rend the curtain that veils the cosmos. They do not exceed the bounds of our human capacities. But the primordial experiences rend from top to bottom the curtain upon which is painted the picture of an ordered world and allow a glimpse into the unfathomable abyss of the unborn and of things yet to be. We find such a vision in the Shepherd of Hermas, in Dante, in the second part of Faust, in Nietzsche's Dionysian experience, in Wagner's Ring, Tristan, Parsifal, in Spitteler's Olympic Spring, 
in William Blake's paintings and poetry, etc. Such a primordial experience as Jung speaks of lies behind these engravings for the Book of Job. Now, in this book, Dr. Edinger has put his comments directly next to each of the engravings about which he is speaking. I will present the images of William Blake's engravings here to the left side of your image. This is the title page. Seven winged angels move clockwise from upper right downward and upward to the left. S. Foster Damon informs us that Blake identified these with the seven eyes of God mentioned in Zechariah 4.10 and with the seven eyes of the Lamb in Revelation 5.6. According to Jung, Satan, who instigated the whole Job drama, is presumably one of God's eyes, which go to and fro in the earth and walk up and down in it. Job 1.7. Thus, the theme of the eye of God is immediately introduced. It is Yahweh's intention, via the machinations of Satan, to sacrifice Job. As the drama unfolds, however, the subject and object of scrutiny becomes reversed. Footnote. For more on the eye of God theme, See Edward F. Edinger, The Creation of Consciousness, published by Inner City Books in 1984. Picture 1. This picture shows Job's initial state of prosperity and contentment. He and his family are gathered under the tree of life in a state of prayer. It is to be noted that the animals are asleep and the musical instruments are hanging on the tree. A state of innocence and somnolence prevails. Both instinctual and spiritual cultural energies are not functioning. Job is living by the book, as suggested by the open books in the laps of both Job and his wife. He is backed up by institutional religion, signified by the cathedral on one side, and his material well-being indicated by the flocks and barns on the other side. But the sun is setting, and the moon is in the last phase. This shows the initial innocent state of the ego that feels secure in its unconscious assumptions and collective containments. It is a state of participation mystique, with surroundings and social groupings, family, community, church, etc. Above the picture are the first lines of the Lord's Prayer, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, which suggests that it is an innocent, trusting Lord's Prayer attitude toward God, which is about to be sacrificed. The theme of the sacrifice is indicated by the altar with the sacrificial fire at the bottom of the picture. The whole engraving of Job and his family is contained within a cloud of smoke rising from the altar, as though Job were the sacrificial victim. Inscribed in the altar are the words, The letter killeth, the spirit giveth life, indicating that it is the word and Job's reliance on it which are to be sacrificed. A tent-like form also frames the picture, as though we were seeing into the tabernacle tent which houses Yahweh's presence. The vast flocks of sheep emphasize the theme of sheep-like docility, collectivity, and innocence. Picture 2 in the lower part of the picture, Job seems to be reading and proclaiming the word of the book. Up above in heaven, something else is going on. The unconscious has been activated. Yahweh, like Job, has a book in his lap, as though he too had been functioning by the book. Also, many of the angels have books or scrolls, but now an intense dynamism approaches Yahweh. Satan, the autonomous spirit, 
manifests in a stream of fire, as the urge to individuation and greater consciousness, he stirs up doubts and questions which challenge the status quo and destroy the complacent living by the book. Yahweh and Satan plot to put Job to the test. The question is, will Job remain loyal to Yahweh in spite of the adversity? It is as though Job has known only the benevolent aspects of Yahweh, and Yahweh needs to be known in his totality, good and bad. Throughout the Old Testament, Yahweh is exceedingly concerned with receiving praise and exclusive recognition from man. Concerning this aspect of Yahweh, Jung writes, quote, the character thus revealed fits a personality who can only convince himself that he exists through the relation to an object. Such dependence on the object is absolute when the subject is totally lacking in self-reflection and therefore has no insight into himself. It is as if he existed only by reason of the fact that he has an object which assures him that he is really there. Unquote. Hence, we can hypothesize that it is the self's need to be known in its totality, its oppositeness, by the ego that initiates the drama of Job. Blake pictures Satan in terms of intense energy. He is in a cloud of flame and his movements are wild and flame-like. Dionysian energy of excess has erupted into the Apollonian realm of order, measure, and form. This picture is reminiscent of a passage in Blake's The Marriage of Heaven and Hell. Quote, Without contraries is no progression, attraction and repulsion, reason and energy, love and hate are necessary to human existence. From these contraries spring what the religions call good and evil. Good is the passive that obeys reason. Evil is the active springing from energy. Good is heaven, evil is hell. Unquote. Further quote, Those who restrain desire do so because theirs is weak enough to be restrained. The restrainer or reason usurps its place and governs the unwilling. And being restrained, it by degrees becomes passive, till it is only the shadow of desire. The history of this is written in Paradise Lost, and the governor or reason is called Messiah. The original archangel or possessor of the command of the heavenly host is called the devil or Satan and his children are called sin and death. But in the book of Job, Milton's Messiah is called Satan, for this history has been adopted by both parties. It indeed appeared to reason as if desire was cast out, but the devil's account is that the Messiah fell and formed a heaven of what he stole from the abyss. This is shown in the Gospel, where he prays to the Father to send the Comforter, or desire, that heaven may have ideas to build on, and Jehovah of the Bible being no other than he who dwells in flaming fire. Unquote. If this isn't clear, it is because Blake is presenting a paradox. By one account, Satan, or desire, is evil and to be banished. By another account, Satan, or desire, is the Messiah who descends to earth for man's salvation. The connection between Blake's fiery Satan and Messiah is also suggested by the uncanonical saying of Jesus, quote, He who is near me is close to the fire, unquote. In this picture, Satan represents the return of banished energy and desire which by rejuvenating the personality may function as savior in spite of its apparent destructive effect. Picture 3. In this picture, the energy dynamism reaches its highest pitch. Almost pure explosive energy erupts in consciousness, destroying its containing structures. 
The picture shows the destruction of Job's children and their families. Job himself has not been touched. For him, the effects are still peripheral. Psychologically, this might correspond to the onset of bad dreams and neurotic symptoms in an individual. Anxiety, depression, insomnia, and psychosomatic symptoms of all kinds. Dreams of atomic explosions, fires, floods, and catastrophes would correspond to this phase of the Job drama. Picture 4. This picture shows the arrival of the bad news. Three messengers are visible at different distances. In the direction from which they come can be seen a cathedral. This suggests that it is the established religious structure, the traditional container of transpersonal values, that is being destroyed by the energy erupting from the unconscious. Certainly that is true for Job. Although his so-called comforters counseled him to accept the traditional religious view, Job insisted on being true to his experience, though it ran counter to tradition. Likewise, in Blake's time, the Age of the Enlightenment, the traditional Christian worldview was in the process of being destroyed by the erupting energies of reason, science, materialism, and technology. In our picture, the fading cathedral in the distance is overshadowed by prominent megalithic druidic forms in the foreground. There is thus a movement toward more primitive and less differentiated religious structures. This corresponds to the fact that an encounter with the unconscious does tend to break up merely formal, habitual religious patterns and promotes a more vital, albeit more primitive, living connection with transpersonal realities. As the messengers arrive, Job and his wife look apprehensive. The symptoms of the activated unconscious are reaching awareness and the ego is alarmed. Picture 5. Job has reacted to his symptoms by an intensified emphasis on the conventional virtues. He is shown here distributing alms, while in heaven Satan is about to pour fire on him. Yahweh on his throne looks as despondent as Job. Both have fallen into a neurasthenic state, while Satan is in command of the immense energies. Job's losses, servants, flocks, and family, have fallen into the unconscious. The energies that have been lost to the conscious personality have increased the energy charge of the unconscious. This picture shows the way the ego often tries at first to deal with psychic symptoms. Rather than confront them and learn their meaning, it splits them off and dissociates them from consciousness. The net result is an impoverishment of the conscious personality, which can continue to function only with minimal energy and under severe limitations. The dissociated state is indicated by the sharp line of demarcation, which separates the human world from the divine world. Picture 6. Here even the limited adaptation breaks down. The activated unconscious now pours itself directly onto Job, the ego. This is the picture of an acute breakdown. All defenses have collapsed. The picture shows Job being stricken with boils. In dreams, boils represent festering, neglected complexes which are erupting into consciousness. If the urgent needs of the unconscious have been neglected, they are then apt to take on a negative pathological aspect and force the ego to give them attention by inflicting pain. This is the last glimpse of the sun. It will not reappear until the final picture. Satan has four arrows in his right hand with which he is about to pierce Job. This means that Job is being attacked by the quaternity, the wholeness of the self. He is to be transfixed, pinned to the earth, as in certain alchemical pictures, which show this happening to Mercurius. 
In alchemy, this is an image of coagulatio, a process of solidification or concretization, and is analogous to Christ being nailed to the cross. One may also think of Cupid's arrow of passion and of Bernini's sculpture, The Ecstasy of St. Teresa. The broken pitcher below the picture suggests that the ego as a container may break if more is poured into it than it can stand. The motif of the broken vessel is found in the Lurianic Kabbalah. According to this doctrine, the creation of the finite world required that the divine light be poured into bowls or vessels. Some of these bowls, the seven lower sephiroth or the sephirotic tree, could not stand the impact of the light and broke, causing the light to spill. This picture suggests that Job is such a vessel. Like the Apostle Paul, Job could be called a chosen vessel to bear God's name. Job, in fact, did not break. His ego remained intact. He maintained his integrity and thus served as a vessel for the divine consciousness. The broken shepherd's crook in the lower left corner indicates the loss of an innocent. The Lord is my shepherd attitude. Certainly what is happening to Job in this picture, with Yahweh's permission, does not square with the idea of Yahweh as a good shepherd. It reminds us of Yahweh's words and actions as expressed through his prophet, Zechariah. Quote, No longer am I going to show kindness to the inhabitants of the world. It is Yahweh who speaks. But instead I mean to hand over every man to the next and to his king. They shall devastate the world, and I will not deliver them from their hands. Then I began to pasture these sheep bred for slaughter for the sheep dealers. I took two staves, one I called Goodwill, the other Union. And so I began to pasture the sheep, but I began to dislike the sheep, and they equally detested me. I then said, I am going to pasture you no longer. Let those that wish to die, die. Let those that wish to perish, perish and let those that are left devour each other's flesh. I then took my staff, good will, and broke it in half, to break my covenant that I had made with all the peoples. Footnote, Zechariah 11, 6 through 10. In this passage, God pours out his wrath on mankind, that is, primitive rage from the unconscious pours into the conscious personality, generating wars and murderous dissension. This picture shows Job being afflicted with disease. It reminds us that illness, as subjectively experienced, is a divine manifestation that crosses our willful path. Whatever its more specific message may be, a painful disease or injury demands that the ego give attention to the non-ego. Pain is the great enigma of existence. It is the perpetual dark companion to sentient being. A patient in the aftermath of an experience of intense pain, renal colic, for example, found these words forming themselves within him. Quote, going to the school of pain. Pain says, if one would teach, he must first get the student's attention. I am an excellent attention getter. I am deep. If you would not fear me, be deep like me. I come from the center. A point is my sign. A stab from me is the cosmic goad. If you would not fear me, live each present moment with the same intensity that you experience me. I am the great purifier. Only the essential can endure me. All else is burned away. I am the great valuer. All values come from me and my partner, death. I am the gateway to the mysteries. An image of me is your highest concept of the sacred. I am the quintessential now. I lie in ambush for those who miss their daily dose of life. 
this elixir unconsumed accumulates and overspills its little vial, raining its concentrated torrent on the negligent soul. I am the angel of annunciation for the awesome now. Time is a gliding serpent bearing precious jewels upon its back, each jewel a present moment. Footnote, Jung is quoted as saying, God is the name by which I designate all things which cross my willful path violently and recklessly, all things which upset my subjective views, plans, and intentions, and change the course of my life for better or for worse. Interview with Good Housekeeping Magazine, December 1961. This is the end of part one of this reading. I will resume with picture seven in the next part.